Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Another piece of equipment teardown slash repair kind of video for you, but this thing's a little bit different than what I normally cover on the channel. This is a Fluke Etherscope, what they call network assistant. It's really kind of a multi-function test slash network analyzer device. The whole idea is this is a tool that a network engineer can carry around with them at work and it'll help them diagnose and troubleshoot a variety of issues that can happen with a corporate Ethernet network. Um, obviously, it's a portable unit. It runs off of batteries. And in tradition with kind of a lot of Fluke's other test equipment devices like multimeters and scopes and all that, it's got the blue and yellow color scheme. And then this yellow bit is actually kind of a rubber like jacket that you can take off. Um, obviously, this one is torn, and there's very good reason for why this jacket is torn, which we'll get into a little bit later. That's uh, very pertinent to the repair we need to make. Uh, there's not a whole lot going on in terms of ports. On the top here, you've got an RJ45 Ethernet jack. This is 10100 slash gigabit as well. Um, you've also got an SFP slot for sticking in a fiber optic module. This will also only go up to gigabit speeds. And then a pair of slots. The top one is a PCMCIA card slot, and that's for sticking in an optional Wi-Fi card to do wireless detection slash troubleshooting. Although, given the vintage of this particular device, <laughs> the functionality was fairly limited back then. And then below it is a compact flash card slot for storing config data and files. Around the right side, you've got the uh, spot where the stylus is supposed to go. Of course, this, it's missing on this one because uh, this is not my device. Like I didn't buy it myself. It belongs to my work and it's been sitting in a drawer for forever broken. So I figured, hey, might as well see if I can resuscitate it. So one of my former colleagues likely lost the, uh, the stylus. You've also got a standard nine pin serial port, USB, the DC power input, and then strangely headphone and microphone jacks on the side. I'm not quite sure what those are for, especially since the documentation says simply that they're for future use. I'm not quite sure what Luke would have had in mind. And then on the back side is this flip up kickstand and underneath it is where the battery goes. And this is all kind of related as to why this rubber jacket is torn. Obviously this thing's been put on and taken off of this device frequently. And that is because the DC socket on the side is bad. Uh, it's the typical problem where you stick the jack in there and it just kind of wiggles around really loosely like the, the socket itself inside is broken. Unfortunately, it also doesn't pass current. So not only is it loose, it just physically doesn't work. So what I think has been going on is every time someone wanted to use this device, they would have to drop the battery pack in it. And these battery packs are actually kind of nice. They're lithium ion, like 34 watt hours, but they've also got a built-in gauge for telling you how much charge the battery has on it. And that is super useful because in order to use this device with the broken jack, you have to charge the battery externally using this separate standalone battery charger. So having to remove the battery to charge, it's really inconvenient because if the battery's dead, you have to wait for it to charge up before you can actually use the analyzer. Since the DC jack is broken, you can't just plug it in if it's dead and still use it out in the field. So my hope is to get that jack fixed so that we can finally get this thing working the way it's supposed to. Um, these batteries, when new, were supposed to be good for about four hours of runtime. I should note that this product dates back to something like 2005. All right, so let's get this thing torn down. And not only can we see what it's gonna take to fix, but we can also take a look at the parts inside because I'm kind of curious as to how this thing works. Someone's definitely been in here before, um, probably seeing what's going on and whether they're capable of fixing it because the, uh, the warranty void sticker had already been sliced open. Yep. 
And for good measure, I'll pull the compact flash card out as well. This one's a 64 meg card. I don't think the OS or anything lives on this though. I suspect there's some circuitry underneath this PCMCIA card cage. Um, interestingly enough, it looks like it just sockets into the board. Typically these are soldered down, so that's an interesting bit of modularity. I think if I flip this over, yeah, it looks like there's four Torx screws that hold that cage to the board. There we go. All right, let's take a quick look at some of the chips on this board starting in this upper corner. This is an Intel flash storage chip. It's 64 megabytes in size. So I suspect this is where the operating system actually gets stored. Next to it is a RAM chip. It's two megabytes. I don't think this is part of the system RAM though. We'll look at that in a second. I think, I'd like to say this is probably some sort of memory buffer, perhaps as part of the whole architecture for testing networks. I'm not quite sure, but only two megs really wouldn't be enough for this system. This Epson chip is actually really simple. It's the LCD controller, and we'll take a look at the LCD itself last. This chip from NXP is a USB 1.1 controller. There's like some logic and flip-flop chips and stuff down in the middle. What's interesting to me is this chip from Marvell. This is the main CPU. What's interesting is more than one manufacturer actually made this series of chips. I couldn't find the data sheet for this specific one from Marvell. However, I did find the data sheet for the version manufactured by Intel. It's the same part number, so I'm pretty sure they're identical chips just sold and manufactured by different companies. What's interesting about this chip is it is kind of an SOC, although it's not as highly integrated as we see in chips today. It's 400 megahertz, but it's based on the ARM architecture. Intel has definitely in the past manufactured ARM chips, which is really interesting. I was kind of expecting this device to run x86, but obviously since it's a mobile device and battery life is gonna be a factor, ARM makes a lot more sense in this use case. Okay, so these two Samsung chips, and there's another two identical ones, just like them on the opposite side of the board. I'm pretty sure these are what constitute the system RAM. All together, they total 128 megabytes. So between 64 megs of flash storage and 128 megs of RAM, I'm pretty sure we're looking at kind of a standard system architecture here. There's just one more chip on this side of the board that's interesting to me, and it's this other one from Marvell. This is a gigabit ethernet controller. What's interesting about this chip is well, actually two things. One, it has built-in diagnostic capabilities. This isn't like a run-of-the-mill ethernet chip like you might necessarily see just on the motherboard of a laptop or desktop. I mean, they could have, but this one's got some additional capabilities including the necessary hardware support for doing cable testing. We'll get to that in a little bit, but it specifically calls out in the data sheet that this thing is capable of doing TDR tests. So this chip is what's gonna support the ethernet ports on the top of the device. The other thing that I found really surprising about this is even though this device itself is from 2005, the data sheet is still up to date on this, which means Marvell still sells this chip, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, Gigabit is still a relevant technology today for Ethernet, so why try to come up with a new chip if they've got one, you know, that they designed a long time ago and still works? So yeah, 15 years later, you can still get this chip in devices if you want it. The other side of the board is where we start to see this become less like kind of a typical PC architecture and more into test equipment kind of stuff. Uh, this Xilinx chip is an FPGA. It's got a million gates. And then if I flip the board around, 
and try to find the chip. There we go. Um, this one is a CPLD. So these are gonna start to work together with the software running on this device to do some of the more advanced testing that you can't necessarily just do with commodity hardware and software on its own. And the last device to look at on this board, this analog devices chip, that's an audio chip. So not only did Fluke actually put headphone and microphone jacks on the side of the device, but they used a commodity AC97 compatible audio chip in this thing. And the CPU datasheet says it supports working with chips like this. So conceivably you could get full quality audio playback as in like if you were to hack up the software running on this device you could play mp3s off of it through the headphone jack in decent quality which is again you kind of wonder what fluke had in mind for full duplex audio in and out of this test device Obviously it never came to fruition because they never added any features that used it. The manual just says for future use, but at least the hardware's there. So that's pretty much it for interesting stuff on the PCB. There's only just that one board in this device. So here's the screen. This is a 6.4 inch resistive touch active matrix LCD. The touch is what's on this second ribbon cable. It's made by a company called PVI. Uh, it's admittedly not a super high-end display, but it's good enough to do the job. Not much to write home about, although there is an epic typo on page three of the data sheet for this part. Something I just noticed, there's a couple of pieces of heat shrink tubing around these plastic bits. These are the light pipes that allow the light from the LEDs on the board to shine through the front of the case. They must have put the heat shrink around these to prevent bleed from one pipe to another. So that like when an LED is shining through one of them, it doesn't also show up on the other one and make you confused as to what's lit up. Okay, let's try to fix what's actually wrong with this thing, the jack. This problem is actually not what I was expecting. Uh, typically when these DC input jacks, like these barrel style, when they fail, most frequently I've seen them physically break, like the top part of the plastic breaks off because someone plugs in a cable and like tweaks on it too hard. Super common with laptops, right? We've probably all seen that at least once. What's strange is in this case, the part itself is fine. There's nothing physically wrong with the jack. It broke off the board. I was hoping it was just as simple as like a solder joint that had failed, but no. It broke the pad off the board. That's really crappy design, especially on Fluke's part, because they know this jack is going to see some stress. This whole thing really should have been anchored down, right? Like with a bracket or something like that over it, because I mean, obviously people are gonna be plugging cables into and out of these jacks a lot, especially if that's the primary way you're supposed to charge the battery in this thing. But there was just no support given to this thing other than three solder pads on especially outside edge of the board like this. So I'm pretty sure it's the same thing on this one. The pad got lifted. The only pad that still remains. And yeah, this is the only solder pad still holding this jack to the board. Uh, let's get some tools out and remove this jack and see what the status of the traces and everything is. Hopefully this is something that's still repairable. There we go. Yeah, as I suspected, um, lifted the pads. What's interesting is I figured all of this would be part of the ground plane. Apparently it's not. This is all just unpopulated, unused. This is the negative trace and it's still going to the pad that exists and is still tied to the board. So this is all ground plane. And then here's the positive trace, and you can see how it's even peeling up here. So trying to like scrape some of this off and just kind of carefully tack it back onto the solder pad on that jack isn't really going to work so well. Um, I'm going to need to figure out a way to physically adhere the jack back down to this board, probably using glue of some sort, even though I don't really like doing that. And then maybe a bodge wire of some sort, scrape off some of the solder mask on this and tie a little bodge wire into the positive terminal. 
because this thing isn't really tied into the ground plane over here, I don't actually have to worry about resoldering this side. Both of these on the jack go to the negative side, the ground plane. So all I really have to worry about is making sure that this one is still soldered down correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and do that off camera because I've told you how much soldering on camera kind of sucks. And we'll see what I'm able to come up with. Okay, here's what I came up with. Uh, soldered down the pad, that was still good. And then I ran three bodge wires. This is epoxy coated magnet wire. Uh, soldered it to that leg on the back. And then on the flip side of the board, I had just run it through those vias and soldered it to the leg of that component, which is where that trace happens to go. Uh, nice, tidy repair. I'm thankful that those vias were there. I really don't like having to run wires around like the outside edge of a board. They're just begging to get snagged or whatever if you're disassembling or reassembling the unit. So this wiring, thankfully, is small enough to just pass straight through those vias. But uh, I think that's going to work. I tested it for continuity. It looks good. Um, I will fess up that I ended up just super gluing the jack back down to the PCB. Uh, I can't really think of a better way that isn't very time consuming to come up with a better permanent attachment for this jack. It really should have had like a metal bracket that would go over it and screw through the board, you know, have a bracket on both sides just to sandwich it down. Or the better thing would have been to have it be supported by the enclosure itself. But uh, clearly Fluke decided to cheap out either intentionally as a matter of planned obsolescence or not. Um, I suppose it could be possible to like design and 3D print some kind of bracket that would press down on this jack by the casing. Maybe I'll do that, but for now, I'll just be very careful when plugging and unplugging the cable into this jack so I don't break it off the board again. Okay, just finished putting this thing back together. I guess moment of truth, I'm not going to put the battery back in it so we won't get false results there. Uh, power cord goes in this side. Hey, look at that! That backlight sure isn't very bright, is it? Interesting, date of 2007. So maybe this thing did get some updates, or this was sold a little bit later on in its life, and they had a few revisions to the software since it was launched in 2005. Okay, that took a minute for this thing to boot up. It is only 400 megahertz after all, but uh, we're starting to get into it here. What's interesting is I don't think this thing runs Windows CE. Um, I'm seeing some references in the manual to Linux. I don't know much detail about it. They don't provide it. And I kind of doubt there's much we can extract out of this thing as to the details of what like distro or whatever it's running. But I was really surprised to see that this thing wasn't based on x86 and running something like, you know, Windows CE or Windows 98 or whatever. It seems like a lot of test equipment from the early 2000s kind of went that route. So it's nice to see that this thing does Linux instead. But here you can see some of the functions that this thing can do. I can't get into all of them because some of these require specific network switches or you know enterprise grade equipment that this thing gets connected to to test. And obviously I don't have an enterprise grade network at home. I know it may come as a surprise to some of you since I'm a network engineer, but yeah, I when I get home, I don't wanna do more work like I do at work, if you know what I mean. Um, so what we can do is some of the more basic stuff like cable tests. I don't remember how long this one is, but something that's really cool about this device is like I mentioned a little earlier on, it can do TDR, time domain reflectometry testing. Um, that's basically where it sends a signal down the cable and sees how long it takes for that signal to bounce back to the device. And the length of time it takes for the signal to bounce back, and I'm, I'm totally generalizing this to avoid spending forever talking about it. The time it takes for that signal to basically bounce back to this device allows it to figure out how long the cable is, or if like one of the conductors is broken halfway down the run or whatever, it can tell you where the fault in the cable is. And that's where devices like this come in super handy. In order to do a full, you know, wire, what they call wire view, wire map, whatever test, um, you need this guy on the other end of it. It's kind of like a loopback type device. Um, of course, the locking tab has been broken off because, you know, why wouldn't it be? And then they also include this adapter. So if you're testing just a regular patch cable, um, you can do that. Wire map is basically where it just 
checks all of the individual conductors in the cable to make sure that they're wired up correctly and have continuity from end to end. This thing can do tests against cables with the other end still plugged into something like a computer or a server or whatever, but it can't do the wire map test necessarily with it still plugged in to another device. Okay, so I've got the patch cable plugged in to this device. Uh, let's just do a start test. Yep, that's fine, go for it. And in this case, this cable passes uh, because it's showing, you know, to open, all the ends are fine. It's not showing any errors in the cable. One thing that's really interesting, look at the distance, 26 feet to locator. Locator is that little device on the end here, this thing. Um, I guessed it was a 25 foot cable. Oh, I was pretty close. This thing isn't gonna be 100% accurate with distance just because of various factors. But again, the whole idea is to get you kind of close to it. Like you can see, it's got slightly different numbers on each of the pairs, 25, 27, 26, 26. But again, it's kind of close enough. And the fact that it's not coming back with any errors is a good thing. Um, it's saying pin eight is open, but that's, I think more just because of the tabs being broken off on this sucker, but I think you get the idea for this. It can also do fiber optic connections. I don't have anything that I can use to test fiber connections, but those can be super useful. And like I said, it can do a bunch of other tests as well, not just physical cable ones, but it can communicate with switches. And if you've got a certain protocol on your switches turned on called LLDP, it can actually tell you which port on the switch the other end of the cable is connected to if you need to kind of like trace it out. Um, it can connect to the network. This thing has the full TCP IP stack. I mean, it's running Linux. It's a full operating system. So it can make sure that you're getting an IP address from your DHCP server and that you can pass traffic and you can check to see if there's weird traffic on the network, like a whole ton of broadcast traffic or multicast or stuff like that. It can be a really useful tool depending on what you're trying to troubleshoot. I am curious if I go into settings under version, will it give me more details? See how this manufacturing date, look at that, 050509. So this product has been on the market for a while. They don't sell it anymore. I don't know when it was discontinued, but even though it was introduced in 05, this one was made in 09. So that's a really interesting bit of information. That is fairly typical with test equipment, especially expensive industrial or commercial test equipment like this. The technology doesn't really change a whole lot. And even in 09, this thing was still very much a valid choice, even though hardware wise, like a 400 megahertz ARM chip, that seems kind of anemic for 09, but for a device like this, it worked fine. So yeah, here's an example of just some of the other built-in features that could be really useful out in the field if you're trying to troubleshoot or make configuration changes to like a business network. I think this device's main goal was to combine features and tools into one unit. So you didn't need a separate network cable tester and a laptop. You could do everything in here. And you can see a lot of these functions are ones that you would just use a regular laptop for, especially Telnet SSH terminal. You could connect into a network switch, make configuration changes. You can then test them by doing ping checks and, and trace routes. It looks like it was a pretty decent, well-rounded product for its time. Now, of course, what I showed here just barely scratches the surface of what a device like this is capable of doing. I don't think anyone has the patience for me to go through and explain everything that's in this tool. That's kind of beyond the scope of this channel. And don't worry, I'm not planning on getting too into a whole bunch of like test equipment teardowns and repairs. This is just kind of a one-off. There's plenty of other really good channels that do those kinds of, of videos, but I wanted to take a look at the inside of this thing to see what it was based on, like its chipset and its capabilities, because these quasi computer kind of devices are really interesting to me. And that's why I'm interested in like the hardware engineering of game consoles and stuff too. It's like there's computer like parts inside it, even though the device itself isn't really completely a computer, or at least it's not intended to be a computer as we know it, like with desktops and laptops. So seeing the parts inside this thing was really interesting to me, especially the fact that this thing apparently runs Linux. It's using an ARM based CPU from back in 2005, 
Obviously, that's nothing new today. I mean, most of the devices that we use that are this size and form factor are gonna be running Linux and have an ARM-based CPU, but the fact they did it back in 05 is what's really interesting to me. Anyway, I did manage to find an old magazine article with an ad in it listing the price for this thing when it was new in 2006. $8,500 US. And even today, I'm seeing companies selling refurbished units for like 2,000 bucks. I don't know if that's a practical price, if anyone's actually paying that or not, but I can tell you that test equipment like this, typically when it's brand new, can go for a lot of money. I don't know if there's any other manufacturers out there making these all-in-one kind of devices, Fluke doesn't make devices like this anymore. They've separated out their product lines into a bunch of individual tools designed to perform specific functions. And I don't know if that's in an effort to spur more sales or just the realization that most networking people are probably gonna carry a laptop with them anyway. But I can tell you this, for how much this device originally sold for, uh, carrying around a laptop doesn't sound like such a bad idea to me now. If you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.